Hello, Melbourne. <laughs> you gonna do a capella, Jenny? <laughs> gonna grab my girl, gonna hold her tight. <laughs> Are you going to be all up? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Hey, guys, do you want to get up so we can see the... Yeah. So, apparently we're using the mics, so we're going to do a very smart shifting. Going to do a sword of people on stage with mics. That's a developer joke. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> I think by the end of two days, you are literally here. Oh, I feel now much more. <laughs> We kind of we kind of go to We'll be sort of like we are now, and then we'll lean into the mics when we're talking a bit more. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So basically, what we're gonna do is, uh, yeah, you wanna say something? Oh, you don't have to. Hey, Josh, Josh. Hey, Josh. You don't have to do that. Um, it's just like, like this sort of thing Talk is, from here. should be okay. So, do you wanna do a sound check? Yeah. Hey, Dick, do you wanna do a sound? So, just. So, is that okay from there? Hello there. Is that alright, just speaking from here? Or should I be leaning in a bit more? Yeah. Okay. So better for me to be about here. Okay. About, about that? That's good, guys. So just talking here like this. Do, do you want to have a listen? So just, so just taking in a bit of noise from there. Is that, like, is that good enough from there? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so about so, that sort of... So just saying here, yeah, saying... Yeah. How, how do I switch into the browser? I actually don't know. Okay, so escape, you are in the browser. Yeah. So escape, I open a few things. Oh, awesome. I open EDX awesome. Coursera, even I logged in. Yeah. So you... Yeah. Around here. Yeah. So this is all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Not great. Too close. So you're not taking the first to talk, you're all chipping in. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Good day. Hey, and I'm in this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, great to meet you, man. Yeah. So it's Vova, Ahmed, and Josh. Vladimir, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. No, we we got time yeah. right here, so I'm go, I'm gonna knock the mic. I'm gonna I'm I'm looking after that. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, would you like an introduction, or are you ready to start with most of the people are in the room? Oh, we should be alright. Yeah, we can start. I'll be up the back and see if you need any help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Huh? Cool. No, no, it'll be alright. Don't forget that part. Yeah, we will. So um, hey, thanks, John. So you basically just go to the browser, uh, open the new page, then you go back to here, uh, to presentation, and view present, oh yeah, you get the button cool. here. Wi-Fi is awesome, yeah, thanks. Let's go. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> spruiking, I love it. <laughs> going, going hot. That's beautiful. <laughs> Where's the video? Where's the video? Oh, <laughs> video? oh my god, they should come again. We always come again, drums. He's got it just like that. Uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for coming in. Uh, we're a team technocrat. We present three of us. So, uh, and we're gonna talk about Drupal and education. Basically, gonna um, go through what we're gonna cover today. And today we're gonna cover learning management systems. And uh, basically, gonna look at different types of learning management systems and variation of learning management systems. Uh, then we're gonna look at the actual existing learning management systems uh, currently on the market and currently in. Uh, wide use. We're going to look at the variation of learning management system called uh, platforms and um, 
how do you eat them. Then we're going to look at the Drupal and how Drupal actually fits into learning and management system market. Because at the moment there is no big system actually Drupal produced to work with. But at the same time there are a lot of projects happening around Drupal and learning management systems. Okay, is that better? Good. Uh, then we're gonna look at something we've been uh, doing internally called Project Lantern. And then we're gonna look at the actually variations of what you can do with learning management system. So I'm gonna take us through um, just the single variation, single vision of where you can actually take uh, what approach can you take and actually uh, how you can change the learning management system. So as I said, we are from Technocrat. Uh, Michelle was supposed to be doing talk, but she actually had some other commitments, so she had to go. So Ahmed, our class clan services director, uh, replaced her. So thanks for doing that on a short notice. Pretty much was sitting there doing slides all day. And Josh and me, we are senior developers in Technocrat, but we're not going to give you a boring speech about um, any development stuff, so it's more about actually education. So uh, learning management system, what they are, we actually perceive learning management system as uh, very simple. In fact, the goal is quite straightforward. So it usually represents some sort of educational institution. It's um, usually around the content of particular course or something very, very similar, and it usually um, gives us this uh, teacher-student relationship where students, uh, teacher creates the course, student is being assigned to the course, uh, student goes through assessment of some sort, and then teacher grades it, in the end, student gets uh, the results. But if we look in more depth, the learning management system is actually much, much bigger than that. So rosters, graders, timesheets, collaborations, uh, mail, chat, and uh, um, yeah, so just jumping in there, hi, um, Josh from Technocrat, and um, yeah, I guess um, with any LMS there's always the question of whether um, you're trying to provide an end-to-end -end solution, which is something that can deal with uh, enrollments and possibly even payments and, um, you know, setting people up to join courses and then the actual delivery of the courseware um, and, and the learning experience and then uh, even the examination and the grading and the release of grades at the end. And so um, the question there is whether a given LMS is, you know, aiming to do that entire process or maybe just the middle part of it, which is, you know, the actual uh, delivery of courseware and discussion and, and this type of thing, like uh, during the semester. So if you look at learning management systems on the market at the moment, they do work, but they're very, very complex. If you connect all the nodes together and uh, try to trace one thing to another, there's actually no simple learning uh, management system that you can actually quickly explain to people and you actually have to not only uh, give people a learning management system, but you actually have to learn to use it. How many people are actually using learning management systems? Few. Uh, which systems are you using? Blackboard, Blackboard Learn, yes. Anyone using Moodle? Anyone use Moodle? Yep. Few people there. So there are a few. Anyone using Drupal? as a learning management system? No. That's fine. Sorry? To some extent. Good. Uh, yeah, we might have a conversation in the end what sort of, uh, exactly where this extent goes and yeah, how big or how small you want to see it as well. So uh, we're actually looking at the learning management system and thinking what are the benefits are. Are they actually more for teachers or more for students? How does educational institution actually perceives the goal of learning management system. Uh, in terms of something like an educational startups or sites like lynda.com, is it actually more for business to make money or is it more for users to actually teach them something? So we actually can come from different endpoints and the result might be very, very different. So we're actually talking about different systems. And especially if it's your business, you don't want to have a this is a real life review of uh, current uh, courses online. 
So you definitely don't want to get something like that. <laughs> so those might be quite extreme examples, but I guess the point is that um, you have you know a, a really uh, very large number of different stakeholders or different groups of stakeholders with um, learning management systems, and so then um, it becomes that much more of a challenge to, to keep all of those groups really you know happy and on board with the product. You might have something that um, looks and feels great for students. They really enjoy jumping in there and sharing ideas and checking out their courseware, but that you know might be um, difficult for that university's IT department to, to sustain, or that might be um, difficult for the um, you know the management at the university to be able to um, change or to apply strategy to that product. So you can imagine there are you know different um, demands coming from very different directions for that type of product. So. Uh uh, existing management system, and there are a lot of them on the market. We are uh, going to look at actually uh, three of them. You're going to talk about Banner as well? Uh, yeah, so that's a late addition. You cool. mentioned that one. Sweet. So, uh, yeah, basically uh, the top two, which is Moodle, Blackboard. Just going to talk about Banner. And uh, uh, anyone using Google applications for education? One person. And uh, we're going to look at the custom uh, CMS and what they are. So um, starting off with Moodle, and my intention is actually to um, give Moodle a good rap. I mean, uh, it's an open source product. Um, it's you know um, very well regarded, very popular, very widely used, and a perfectly uh, viable product. So our intention is you know certainly not to say um, you know here's a whole bunch of reasons to use Drupal instead of Moodle or anything like that. And in fact, maybe at that point, just taking a step back and saying that you know the sort of intention of the talk is really to, to just make sure that you're aware of the existing current popular systems, and then to open up a discussion about you know how Drupal uh, might be really good, uh, might be you know um, able to make a really good offering in that space as well. And so um, yeah, but looking at Moodle from that sort of positive point of view, and actually worth mentioning that uh, my colleague Dane has worked with um, Moodle, I think um, here or overseas more. Yeah, and um, had really good experiences with it, and so he's like um, contributed some of the background information about this. And for myself, I'm not 100% familiar with the latest versions of Moodle and, and what they do, but I'm just going to run through this um, with you for a bit of an overview. So yeah, it's also an open source product. Um, it's got you know um, very current uh, releases. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's written in PHP, same as Drupal, and um, yeah, there's the web URL there. And then on the next slide. Um, you'll notice we've got actually a longer list of pros than cons. So maybe we'll just um, open all of those up. And um, it's considered an all-in-one um, solution, although I'm not sure how strong it is um, at those uh, two sort of endpoints that I mentioned before. So I don't know, um, you know if Moodle can really handle uh, enrollments or complex integrations with other enrollment systems. Um, and not entirely sure how it handles, like, um, say, um, release of examination results, this type of thing. But I know that it's really well regarded in that middle phase of, you know, handling students and courseware. So uh, it's considered, you know, very um, user-friendly, uh, user although um, my understanding is there are some sort of setup considerations there. Uh, it's very education-focused but I'm guessing that you could say that about any LMS or it wouldn't qualify. So um, yeah, but you know, it has a very large uh, community of users and a lot of uh, contributed modules. So there are you know, different ways that you can configure it and, and put those components together. And then, um, yeah, it's you know, apparently responsive, so I'm guessing that you know, you'd expect to be able to use it on your phone and, and your tablet. And you can imagine like um, thousands of students you know, spending more time actually reading courseware on their phones than on their uh, desktops these days, at least I would imagine that. So yeah, and then a short list of cons, apparently um, quite complex to set up, um, but I'm not sure if anyone who's had experience with it here would sort of uh, verify that, but you know, uh, quite a sort of complex initial setup phase and um, you know, built more for function than for form. Although maybe I'll just pass to you on that. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Sure. Uh, well, basically, uh, as actually Pros said, it's an education-based system, and what we were trying to say it's a more generic one. So it looks at the education, again, uh, from the perspective is one for everything kind of thing. So we're talking about covering high schools or covering uh, university, covering you know your standard flow where students come in this again stuff that we were talking about student so teacher relationship and course content relationship and in fact uh, at the moment you, you probably can argue at some points of saying where is there's variation of the courses and there is different type of setups you can do but at the same time it's still pretty you, you're still pretty sandbox as a user hmm. so I guess I'm not sure if it's a tangent on that or not but um, you can imagine um, say at a university 
if Moodle was being used for hundreds of courses in parallel and they all had a sort of an out of the box uh, performance and a user experience, say the, you know, the main screens and tabs that you might expect and the peripheral content that you might expect. And um, that might be considered uh, quite rigid and you know, this is a combination of the product itself and the way it gets used and adapted and customized at a particular university. Um, but of course the question is, um, whether all of those uh, courses end up looking and feeling exactly the same. There might be some benefit to that. The student can sort of move between them and have this kind of, you know, similar experiences. Um, but then what about that one uh, lecturer who, you know, wants this list to be over on the left and wants these two tabs to actually be on the same screen or, or this type of thing. And so then, um, yeah, of course, the question and, and the sort of investigation um, as you know, developers or as managers of the product becomes uh, how customizable it is at that point. And so I'm not sure if any of you, you know, come in thinking about, well, uh, how customizable or versatile or how rigid are these products? But that's one of the questions. Oh yeah, and we're mentioning um, Bannock here as well. So um, I've only um, just found out about this, but um, thought it was worth mentioning because that one is considered to be much more of an end-to-end -end, uh, type of product. So that uh, it can actually, um, you know, optionally, rather than integrating with other university systems that might deal with uh, enrollment and administration and this type of thing, it can actually perform those functions itself. So, Blackboard, um, just to preface this overview, I'm actually quite excited about sharing with you guys some ideas around sort of the traditional learning model and you know, what's out there in the future. Um, but to give us some sort of context, looking at Blackboard, I mean, Blackboard's pretty much used by every second university in Australia, possibly the world. Um, it's very much considered an enterprise grade LMS, um, and it's actually really good at replicating the traditional learning model. Um, so the idea of having your standard curriculum replicated in a web page, being able to access your lectures, your content, um, submit assignments and that sort of thing. It's actually very, I would describe it as no offence to any academics that are here, but sort of very academic friendly in the sense that, you know, it's, it's actually a very simple way to actually get a course set up and, and, and transfer, um, you know, the, the traditional learning model online. Um, and you'll find it's actually an extremely popular platform, extremely expensive too. Um, but I, I think a big part of success is this ability to actually just really replicate the traditional uh, classroom in, in an online context. Yeah. yeah, so I was exposed to Blackboard at University of Melbourne and um, I, I saw um, both of those uh, kind of observations uh, borne out. One is the guy, uh, um, you know, with his legs sticking out from under the desk in a bundle of wires. So I saw, you know, some of the complexity and it was more actually, you know, um, administrative complexity yeah. around getting this massive system running across yeah. the university yeah. and all the tangles they got into. Yeah. But then, you know, I've also seen like it uh, really work and deliver courseware to thousands of students. So yeah. both of those perspectives. If you Google for blackboards, you'll actually see that a lot of Australian universities are, are using that. And uh, the reason for it, they've been very <laughs> prominent on the market in the last, especially in the last five years, uh, where they actually changed their goal from being uh, LMS to actually the main goal is now acquiring as much market as uh, they can. And they also went with the cloud solution back in 2011. And the last major versions you saw was released in, back in 2010. After that, there was a lot of controversies about them. There's some patent issues where they're actually trying to sue people, as well as this review from uh, TechCrunch, which basically saying that they were focusing more on uh, stuff like uh, acquisition rather than uh, delivering the end product. So this is where we're talking about business side of model, which benefits pretty much Blackboards in the first place. But then again, we're not trying to say very bad things about them in the end, they're still delivering a product that a lot of universities are using. And yeah, it's worth considering it if you actually, or maybe you're already running. And in fact, come to think of it, um, I've heard far worse things said about um, my source matrix um, as a, like as a CMS used at universities than what I've heard about Blackboard used as an LMS. And, um, but so I guess um, they have also eventually delivered you know, stable content management systems into universities, even if it's taken them a, a few goes to get it right. And um, so then it needs to be said that, you know, a university is a very demanding environment to provide products into, and that, you know, a lot of these um, providers, you know, face challenges and needed to really, you know, provide iterations um, over time to, to really get it right. And then when they do, they can end up with a sort of a, a big, uh, happy marketplace, so. Do you want to add anything? Um, no, I guess the other thing I would add is, you know, given that this is 
the reason the technical audience. You can almost think of the analogy of Blackboard to other learning management systems being the analogy of Java, which is an enterprise grade, you know, language relative to sort of hip stuff like Node.js. And so because it is stable, it doesn't change much. I think the last update was a few years ago mm -hmm. to the actual core platform. You, you can sort of see it sort of in the appeal to the, to the more stable um, sort of enterprise type audience. Um, and it will probably contrast it later with some other alternative um, models. Um, yeah, later in the talk. Mm. Uh, Google Apps for Education, we're quickly going to touch on them. So there is, a, if you're an educational institution, you can go and sign up with Google. And Google is going to provide you very simple, uh, again, very basic down to earth, the student teacher relationship where Google users can go and sign up for a particular course to a teacher or educational institution. And the teacher using the, uh, leveraging the Google applications like uh, Google Sites, Google Drive. And based on those technologies, uh, they also have quizzes. Uh, they're going to provide you a simple course, which pretty much, I'm not sure if it's free or not for educational institution. I know there was a free trial, but at the it's moment, free. I'm not sure it's, it's free, free for yeah. educational institution. So uh, have a go on them. There, there are a few good videos online. Um, check them out if you're actually looking for something uh, very simple, down to earth, but at the same time, you just want a good tools to present a simple course. Uh, yep, this is the, uh, the homepage and some of the big universities actually start using their tools as well. Uh, so, and the next thing we're gonna talk about is the LMS platforms. So LMS platforms is a new kind of beast. They've only been on the market for about, I don't know, uh, three, four years uh, on a large scale. Before there were sites that were doing video courses and standard courses online here and there, but um, uh, basically, uh, a couple of years ago, 2012, I think EDX was one of the first platforms that basically said, okay, we're going to do this open model where we're going to contact universities around the world and, uh, and we're going to offer them to give the courses for free. The idea was it's A, going to provide the free education for the countries who are actually unable to pay or don't have any means apart from the internet to learn and uh, or uh, actually give some universities a promotion. So someone's doing a course, they like it, they, um, they can go on to uni or do their online education and pay for it further on. In fact, uh, Berkeley was uh, accepting as a credit, if you pass it on EDX, they were accepting it as a credit for one or two subjects. So there was a promotion where you do the course for free, uh, you get into, and if you get into Berkeley, we can actually get a credit for the particular subject. So we're gonna go quickly through them and show you around because we're gonna reference those LMS platform later on. We're gonna talk about Project Lantern. So EDX, anyone use those systems? Anyone did the courses? Cool, yeah, few people. people. So um, I'll quickly jump into EDX. It has a list of schools and courses on top. You can basically go and search for them and uh, Okay, and uh, here is your basic kind of program. You can see your progress. Uh, you can go s uh, and see syllabus, do the quizzes for a particular week. There are different sorts of assignment depending on uh, uh, which subject you're taking. If you're taking a programming assignment, there might be different ways to actually submit your assignments. At the moment, on the other side, which we're going to reference a bit later, I'm doing History of Rolling Stones, something for fun as well, which, um, yeah. So if it is a bunch of courses, and if you go to ADX and just browse through the courses, um, there are lots and lots of them there. And a couple of Australian universities are represented there as well. Uh, the problem with ADX was, because I was talking with one of the universities, they said it's very sandbox. So uh, some universities wanted to go a bit further and do interactive assignments or interactive teaching, and the platform wasn't delivering. I think it's open source. I didn't double check that, but I think the actual EDS pl platform is open source and it's based on Django, which is a Python uh, based open source CMS. So, and NOAA is very similar to um, uh, EDX. Just go check them out. It's free to sign up and do some of the courses. Um, so Coursera, um, one of my favorite platform-based LMSs. Um, right now, I'm actually doing a, a really exciting course on machine learning. Um, 
and I'll show you guys just very briefly around how this um, platform looks and what makes it slightly different to some of the other stuff that's out there. How do I actually sign in? You think I know I by now? I oh, signed. okay. I might actually sign out if you don't mind. Sure. Um, So the way, the way Coursera works is that you, um, it, it's actually run by Stanford, Stanford University, um, and you can sign up for courses for free, and again, similar to edX, if you actually get a certain uh, grade, um, you are awarded official Stanford credit, which is pretty cool. Um, one of the things I like about this particular platform is that it actually um, has sort of hooks in it actually, oh, there you go, um, almost there with the course. Let's go into this one. So we've got the course. I have to say, Ahmed's a powerhouse. <laughs> Full-time um, PM at Technocrat, and then learning in his own time on several of these courses, and constantly coming up with ideas. Don't know how you do it. I try. Um, hey, so so you know, let's just take one of these videos, for example, by Andrew, and who's who's actually the CEO. Uh, what is machine learning? In this video. <laughs> the CTO of um, uh, uh, Beidou. And one of the really cool things about this tool is that um, when you're actually watching a video, for example, and a lot of it is very much video-based content, um, it'll, quite often when you're watching these things, no matter how exciting they are, you often fall asleep after a few minutes or you sort of doze <laughs> off. Um, and what I like about this is, that's you know. That's how you wake people uh, up. That's how yeah, you do it. <laughs> when, it's, when it's 11 p.m. at night and I'm trying to struggle through one of these sort of um, courses, you know, you often sort of notice that the, the, the sound sort of disappears and it's like, what's going on? And it actually asks you a question. And so the idea is actually pauses throughout the course, and so it, it actually prompts you and ensures that hey, you're 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 you're, you're in tune with what's, with, with what's going on. And you actually get graded for um so for, for for the answers that you provide. So for example, you know, um, asks this question, I can actually mark an answer, and I actually mark you know install in this grading system, and sort of give me a report at the end of the course. So that does two things. It means that it actually keeps me engaged with the course, as well as actually it's just a, it's a form of learning. So it's a form of reinforced learning. Um, the other thing about Coursera obviously does the usual stuff, so there's regular exercises that you um, submit at, at sort of regular intervals and sort of, you know, you have deadlines that you need to work towards. Um, this sort of reminds me of Moodle. You can see I'm actually falling behind <laughs> in, in my courses there, although I think I have um, did okay in, in a couple of them. But nonetheless, it's actually quite um, interactive, lots of feature rich, and it's actually quite engaging for for, 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 for students. Um, Someone this wrote is, down his password. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to submit um, assignments on my behalf, you can just yeah, go there and do that for me. Um, yeah, that's, that's Coursera in a nutshell. So just jumping in, and I haven't actually seen those um, screens before, but that looks like the kind of thing that I would be expecting to find if I you know, enrolled in one of those yeah. courses where there's you know, a whole range of activities going on yeah. and you're being encouraged, and, you know, but at the same time tested and you know, um, this type of thing, yeah. and you're seeing your results accumulate on, a, on some type of a dashboard and, and this type of thing. Yeah. So that, and I think you know, um, naturally all LMS is you know, aiming for, for those kind of um, engagements and, and for that, those kind of attractive screens that we just saw them. Yeah. Um, and, and the second tool I, I wanted to briefly gloss, gloss over was actually iTunes U. Um, again, so, so I actually have a commerce background and you know, my, my focus has, been always, has always been operation and strategy. Um, but I actually ran into this thing a few months ago where I think Stanford as well, they, they, they published some of their courses on iTunes U. And, and iTunes U is very much a video-based delivery method. You'll notice a common theme, more like video. Um, and I actually did a, a full course, I think it was called Financial Markets by Robert um, uh, something. I can't remember his name. <laughs> How embarrassing. Um, but, you know, iTunes is a, it's a lot simpler compared to Coursera, so you don't actually get interactive assignments. You don't get sort of, I guess, you know, a, a, a sil you know, you do get a syllabus, but you don't get sort of the same amount of course content as you would with, say, something like Coursera. Uh, but again, it's almost like sort of podcast on steroids. Um, really cool, and it's got its own sort of niche, niche market. And so uh, University of Melbourne using iTunes U as well. So and in fact, it was like rolled out quite strategically to just certain universities or some sort of competition to get into that space yeah. at the yeah. beginning at least. And um, what I would say about that is that, you know, um, well, obviously universities want to be uh, um, putting their name and their brand into all the right places. And that includes getting online in all of these, you know, sort of new dynamic kind of ways and learning to share their course content, you know, um, more widely. And I think the ones we're about to move on to, uh, yeah, so there's um, Khan Academy is a good example. 
So I, I guess um, there's a spectrum of these learning experiences, um, starting with uh, um, enrolling, paying and enrolling in a university and entering a private course where you need to log in securely through your own student ID and only you are allowed to interact with that courseware. And then right up at the other end of the spectrum, there's you know this um, completely open web-based courseware that's free. Anyone can engage with it, and in fact, we're seeing that that can then you know contribute back towards your degree. Um, easy for the universities to you know accredit people that way, Absolutely. and kind of good for everyone when you think about it. So um, yeah, along that spectrum, uh, like I was saying, somewhere in the middle, you've got universities that have traditionally been you know uh, um, just privately delivering their courseware that are uh, learning to share. And um, these are the people they're learning from, is, you know, Khan and, you know, in fact, like, YouTube can be considered a learning management system, if you want to think about it that way. And um, there was another one after that, some open universities. There'd also be, like, our University for the Third Age, I think it's called, which is for, like, um, adult and ongoing education. So, yeah, yeah. a bunch of examples. Uh, we're going to cover a, a bit about uh, custom LMS. So when something you actually want to build the LMS from scratch or using Drupal or some, some other system. So it comes with a premium price. And the reason it comes with a premium price is because you have to plan it and then you have to implement it. So uh, the best thing about it, you can have additional features or features that are not implemented yet. So if you think about something interesting, like I'm going to tell you later on, um, you can actually build that. Uh, again, the problem is it's time consuming. If you go with a particular sort of development, it might not result where you actually um, head into. So a lot of things to consider. But basically with a good planning, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of custom CMSs that are actually operational and uh, <clears throat> gonna get. So actually uh, moving on, on to Drupal, there are two basic solutions with uh, um, Drupal. Oh, I mean, majority of them, I'm sure there are other variations as well, but basically you see the Drupal installations as a Drupal as an extension, and Drupal is a complete learning management solution. So Drupal as an extension usually comes as an integration between two systems, usually it's a Moodle, um, and uh, so Moodle acts as a learning management system, and then people who actually um, don't have enough features in extensions of Moodle uh, usually ask Drupal to come along and integrate uh, provide the same authentication and extend on functionality of current system. There are quite a few, and uh, did anyone go to the talk yesterday about Moodle installation with Drupal? No? No one? Okay, so there was actually a talk, so I'll, I missed it, but I'm gonna wait for a recording, and definitely looking forward to check it out. Um, and again, Dr Drupal is used for additional functionality, so something that current learning management system don't provide. So pros of that approach, there are targeted goals, which is usually makes you more focused and makes developer more focused because the, it's already covered by uh, Moodle as such or other learning management system. There's separation of duties, so we, which again kind of makes it less pressure on the developer to deliver the complete system because part of the functionality is already there. But I think there are more cons to that approach. So uh, custom development, uh, even just the integration, it means you have to support two or more systems. Um, so basically, just raise the price of the whole product, and uh, you might need actually multiple specialists, one who is actually doing delivery of Moodle, one who is doing delivery of Drupal, and maybe even another one who actually does the integration as well as authentication. We have multiple authentication solutions that actually can work with number of systems, but then again, it's a uh, it's a matter of paying money and actually uh, getting authentication across multiple systems and testing that. And um, we're also going to look at Drupal as learning management system. Did anyone use ELM, ELMS before? Um, started in Drupal 6. And uh, did anyone use, ever knows what Ubercart is and commerce is? Like big. Um, commerce, two big uh, Drupal commerce projects. So basically your web shops and Ubercart came before commerce, actually built by the same guys in core. And uh, Ubercart was this massive monster approach, same with ELMS in version six, so everything in one. And uh, of course it leads to some, um, you know, pros and cons. The best thing about the ELMS, it was actually built uh, in Pennsylvania State University and still is. There is an awesome talk about version seven in uh, from DrupalCon Austin. Uh, the link's gonna be in the end of the talk. Check them out if you're interested in what can be like 
to actually run the system. But anyway, uh, back in version six, it was one solution for everything. It was a good start. Uh, again, as I said, it's very similar to Ubercard. So one system that covers it all, and then you get small bells and whistles on top of it. So and when we're trying to do many things at once, what happens? Something like that. If you're trying to eat spaghetti in a washing machine. Is that your animation for ELMS in particular? No, it's just doing multiple things oh, at okay, once. For just I didn't say ELMS for that, that, but okay. it's just something to wake people up. Just give it a couple more looks. <laughs> anyway, everyone got it? Good. We know. It does actually remind me of my university days in a strange way, but, <laughs> but not while I was logged into an LMS, but at other times. I'm not yeah. sure what you did in the university. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, then came version 7, the guys decided uh, to actually uh, take a different approach. Again, very similar to Commerce, and actually separated. And there are a bunch of modules and uh, installation profiles for ELMS version 7. In fact, they call it ELMS Learning Network. It's available now, and there are a bunch of, uh, they have their own website, they have their own blog uh, and GitHub repo, as well as they have uh, couple of uh, system uh, s separation. So there is a course information system, there is massively open online course, and there are a bunch of them, you can find the links, and if you're interested in it, just check out this guy's talk, because he also talks about how to install it, what they did for authentication and all that stuff. Uh, and another one, Open Go. Oh, Open Go. I'm not sure. Should I cover that one briefly? So um, that's one that I've only just become aware of. It's a product out of India. Um, it uses um, you know, Drupal um, core and contributed modules, uh, including uh, organic groups, and provides like a you know, fairly comprehensive um, you know, Drupal-based LMS. It looks very simple and neat, but what I heard is uh, you, you actually have some sort of uh, more internal module system. So it doesn't rely, uh, it, it uses one module, I think, and, uh, one module called Apingo, but inside you can kind of have a, like a like a web store with a free editions so you can check in. So they didn't use the standard uh, module for Drupal; they actually build their own system. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. It's just different alternative approach. So Apingo project is the actual module. Apingo.lms it's the it's like commerce kickstart. It's the um, basic distribution. So if you want to start it, probably install uh, Apingo LMS as a distribution. And it uses also a lot of other contributed mo modules like organic groups, quizzes, rules, and views. So this is actually comes if you want to build stuff with, uh, if you want to build stuff with uh, already existing solution, but you can create one yourself. And George is going to cover a couple of modules that actually uh, yeah, you can use to create LMS. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, back in the D7 days, which is now, um, I guess if you were um, planning to build a, um, a, a comprehensive LMS, there would be, you know, naturally a whole bunch of ways you could uh, go about that. And I guess we're thinking about this in quite sort of theoretical terms. It's not something that we're about to do this weekend, but um, something that, you know, is really interesting to talk about because, um, you know, as a, at least as a uh, mental experiment, it uh, puts D7 to the test and allows you to match up a whole bunch of things that you know Drupal 7 can do to um, those demands that we've got in mind and that we've already seen how they're met by other systems. So then um, just glossing over some of the modules that would come to mind for that. Well, naturally, you're going to need to uh, handle um, users as um, user accounts, people being able to log in and then be given roles and permissions. Um, well, then there would be a question of whether you would use organic groups or not to do that. Um, you know, at, at least for people being able to find um, th their groups of content and, and uh, groups of people to interact with, um, and then uh, whether you would use something like Workbench or not, which is more for um, you know permissioning people to uh, you know engage with um, you know um, different types of content or different silos of content on the site. So those you know open questions, and um, you might find for say um, you know a, a really comprehensive LMS that you'd need to uh, rebuild Workbench from scratch, but to do it your way to you know meet a very specific set of needs and you know, to sort of reinvent what some of those modules do. And so then, um, of course, you need to think about uh, those things from the point of view of these different roles, the students, teachers, administrators, and the actual developers on the product who are going to be interacting with that admin UI in different ways. And um, that's what makes, say, an LMS um, a, a really interesting uh, architectural challenge because, um, you know, you would assume that um, in, in these um, structured environments that you're going to want some more kind of rigidity around the admin UI 
but all of these different groups are going to have very different experiences of the admin UI. So a student is going to have a very different uh, experience of you know, interacting with the LMS than, say, the administrator who's responsible for setting up the new courses and deploying them and this type of thing. So then trying to move on really quickly, um, then you know, there are um, some great modules out there that are sort of for learning. So um, quiz and course and achievements are good examples. Um, and then um, we have already sort of mentioned the um, user and course workflow, but I mean, in technical terms, we start to think about our entities, which are like our items of content. Um, and the relationship between entities in the site. I really wanted you to sort of gloss over this. So then, yeah, in fact, I think we can skip ahead at that point. We don't need to sort of dig right down into those modules. You can check out the slides online. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go through Project Lantern, which is an experiment that we in Technica are doing. It's basically a Drupal 8 LMS. So we started early and decided to follow kind of commerce guys' footsteps, and that was main, major inspiration for the um, actual project. So uh, we start doing the custom LMS using uh, Drupal. And um, can, I, can I jump in at that point and just go back one slide? Sorry, I'm starting to enjoy this, so I just think I'll jump in and, and um, say something. Okay, so yep. if I can keep it super brief. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I um, just wanted to say that as developers, we spend most of our time obviously just um, solving very well-defined problems for existing clients, and that only leaves a little bit of time to, um, you know, think about um, you know, understanding or defining these problems in the first place before we go ahead and solve them. And then there's only a very little bit of time left to um, you know, do anything that's kind of blue sky-ish. And that would be contributing back to Drupal 8 or to other contrib modules. And then when we're not doing that, then you know, thinking about this um, problem solving and matching Drupal to different sort of problems and requirements in these more abstract ways, which is kind of the origin of this project, or at least my involvement in it. Again, we approach the First, we approach it differently. We approach it as something like Moodle. We want to recreate Moodle. But uh, we're going to quickly go through the actual objectives of what we're trying to do. But currently, uh, the focus change we're trying to deliver, first of all, something like LMS platform, something people can reuse and use for their business. And again, inspiration was a Drupal Commerce. So our mission is to provide the solution that is alternative, so it's no way in competition to Moodle or other platforms, but actually try to give people something to try on, something different, accessible, responsive, and that we really want to engage the community into the project. It's going to be, uh, delivery is going to be a suite of tools, so you expect your Drupal modules, you expect your distributions but also expect a lot of documentations our philosophy is we're open source but education down developers up which is very unusual for Drupal project where it's usually it's reversed it's uh, always focused on the developers and not on the community we're actually already engaging with a few um, acad academias and few educational institutions in Australia to try to uh, deliver that Again, our audi audience uh, in the order of priority is the educational community, that users who are limited by Kyle LMSs want to hear from them, and then new Drupal users, and also developers. Uh, again, it's an alternative, not a competition, education-driven, and the outcome is going to be a configurations, distributions, modules, and documentations. Uh, I'm not going to go through a structure. You can see the slides online. I'm going to give... Uh, one of the examples is what Amit wanted to talk to, so we got five minutes left, so sure. it's go going to be uh, the actual, um, I'm going to give the word to uh, Amit because his example is what he actually uh, will try to build using something like us, like our LMS. Thanks, thanks Vova. So just very quickly, um, what I'd like to do is actually challenge some of the assumptions and ideas that we have about LMSs. Um, you know, we took a look at some of these, you know, quite amazing uh, platforms, so Moodle, Blackboard, iTunes U, um, and we had a browse around. And my question to you, are, are these just simply glorified content management systems that are really good at integrating with external systems that are out there? Um, and the reason why I ask that is because no matter what current LMS you look at, um, you know, they're, they're effectively divided vertically and horizontally. Um, and when I say horizontally, I'm talking about sort of groups of classrooms. So whether you're, you're a grade prep, one, two, or you're a first year uni, second year uni, third year uni, or vertically across no, um, domains of knowledge. So maths, physics, um, accounting, whatever the subject may be. And, and my question to you is, can we break through these silos? Um, and so there are two types of silos. There are the horizontal silos. And you know, the, a, a way to sort of motivate this discussion is um, to ask the question, whoever is, is, is on Stack Overflow? Right, a lot of people, or Quora, not as many, okay. Well, 
we, when you're on a Stack Overflow, are you segregated by how many years of development experience that you have? So for example, is there a forum for people that are first years, second years, third years? No. Um, in fact, you have all these people sharing experiences um, ac across various levels of experience. So my question to you is what if we conceived of an L LMS where people can actually exchange information, actually teach each other rather than actually just relying on the classic online tutor who stays up to 2 a.m. answering people's questions. Um, and so the classic online tutor that we see across LMS is rather than being there, sort of just, you know, it's a one-way information exchange, they're facilitating the process rather than actually sort of, you know, yeah, just, 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 just being responsible for the entire educational process. And this stems from something called instructional leadership where the idea is to actually distribute the responsibility for learning and teaching across multiple stakeholders, not just mm -hmm. the teacher. It's a really cool idea that gets a lot of traction at universities and so then you see first years going to third year classes yeah. and you see, you know, students sharing yeah. um, learning experiences in new ways. But um, then um, the job of the developer at that point is to say, well, yeah, you can separate, uh, say, courseware from courses and have, you know, essentially like a, um, you know, a, a huge singular canon of all of the um, courseware and then be able to have courses, you know, uh, um, use, you know, subsets of that um, and in quite sort of, you know, overlapping in dynamic ways. Absolutely. So you know, that and, and that actually, that actually really nicely segues into the second um, uh, idea that I'd like to put out there, which is breaking the vertical silos. So we know that in schools that there's aspiration to actually integrate um, uh, knowledge areas. So for example, when you're learning maths, you're often sort of learning, you know, when you teach a little kid about sort of add addition and subtraction, you're actually couching in a real life examples. What if we actually thought of LMSs um, as containing knowledge integration points? Just as the way we actually think about software is sort of being able to effectively integrate with other software and pieces, you know, and, and tools that are out there. And so somehow allowing, you know, if you think about things like me uh, mechatronics, biomechanics, environmental engineering, these are effectively different disciplines coming together and actually creating new domains of knowledge. What if we were able to create a platform that actually allowed this sort of thing to sort of, you know, um, uh, 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 come up organically. So in other words, you know, we create a platform mm. that actually allows sort of, you know, uh, teachers and educators to expose bits of knowledge that allowed sort of another educator to actually say, hey, that's interesting and that can potentially fit into my topic and allow for that cross-pollination. Now that's hard, that's actually really hard because currently our educators, you know, they're, that they have, it's, it's, they're operating in a certain paradigm and to actually get them to sort of think outside of their sort of myopic or sort of their, 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 their channel of, um, expertise requires to actually rethink KPIs, for example. And that's not something that's actually easy to do. Um, the other thing also is different educational settings require different um, integration methods. So at a university, that might be driven by bringing sort of industry expertise into the classroom and actually facilitating the cross-pollination. So for example, I'm actually a marketer, um, but I'd, I'm actually quite interested in learning about finance. And so having someone from industry come in and actually facilitate the cross-pollination is useful in that setting. Whereas at a, at a, at a primary school or at a high school, that can actually happen quite differently. That could be as simple as just getting the science coordinator and the maths coordinator to sit down together and actually figure out a way to facilitate the cross-pollination. But that are, we, we already know that that's just an ideal that sort of academics and sort of you know, teachers sort of work towards. But how can we actually create a, a, a learning management platform that really facilitates that um, intrinsically? And so there you have it. You know, um, as always, I'm gobsmacked after just hearing from, you know, 30 seconds from, from Ahmed. And um, but that, that incredible set of possibilities and really, you know, exciting set of possibilities then um, can be matched to systems that can deliver those experiences. And I guess the whole point of the talk today was to say that, you know, it's entirely possible, in fact, quite likely, that um, Drupal 8 will be the coolest way and most feasible way ever to, you know, deliver those experiences and, and those systems. And so I guess this is really just meant to be a sort of demonstration of, like, um, you know, great sets of possibilities and, you know, uh, um, and matching those up to, you know, what is a new product that we're discovering and coming to grips with and starting to match up to requirements. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess the final, and I would like to exp expand on this a bit more, but the final idea that I should like to put out there, uh, and we don't have time to go into, into this in too much detail, is to contrast the current um, LMS landscape with, um, with, with a complete alternative model. So, you know, th if you look at this, this is tables and rows. And, and, you know, for the geeks that are here, what does that make you think of? The relational database, right? And so what, what I'm putting out is a notion of contrasting almost what's currently sort of an RDBM, RDBMS type LMS, to something that's much more graph-based. And so the idea is that graph-based um, sort of technologies or something that's underpinned by some sort of graph 
um, algorithm will actually allow for better sort of interrelationships across topics, domains, people, and actually the learners themselves. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do look to a lot of these, um, you know, Quora, for example, is amazing at doing this, you know, really sort of driving that interconnection across um, domains of knowledge and, and, and users to, to facilitate much richer learning experiences. Thank you. Well, yeah, as you can see, we got lots to talk about. But uh, again, the, the, the thing is we started building LMS. In fact, I already uh, did few commits today to, to, to the first modules in the system. There's also experimental uh, GitHub repository. So if you're interested in playing that, just hit me up. Otherwise, just um, follow this uh, LMS, the, the links uh, in the end of the presentation. So here's a GitHub for the, for the whole project. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening and let us know if you have any questions.